Exodus chapter 25. Do I get the pointer too? No? If I come back and get it, can I get it? Lasers. All right, we're going to go to Exodus 25. Now, the, the lesson today covers a, uh, a fairly large portion of Scripture. So I doubt that we'll be able to read all that we're going to read, especially since the topic also has a lot of um, intricacies to it. Ha, I used a big word. This is not to scale, but it does give you an idea of the items. And so the one that I have going up on the screen, hopefully in a little bit, is more to scale. But I thought it would be good if we had a little bit of a picture to look at. I think I'm going to have enough, but if not, I'll rob from someone, give it to someone else. How many do we have left? One, two, three, four, five, six. We might make it. You're going to share? Thank you. One. Done. Good morning. Do you want me to call you out in class and make you say the verse and everything? <laughs> All right. We are going to run out. How about that? All right. Can I borrow one? Thank you. There you go. All right. We'll do it that way. And apologies. I can give you my color copy. Je Exodus chapter 25. We're talking about the tabernacle today. Uh, very interesting topic, maybe not for you, but I'm a carpenter, so for me, it's very interesting, especially when we get to the temple that Solomon built. Whenever I start reading through those passages, I'm building stuff in my mind, and then I'm trying to draw stuff out just to see, because that's what I like doing. I know you probably don't do that, but that's me. So, Exodus chapter 25, we're going to read the first eight verses Talk about a couple things, and we're going to get right straight into the tabernacle. Exodus chapter 25, verse number 1. Oh, you got kicked out. Uh, got kicked out too late because I'm out of, <laughs> it was the jacket. <laughs> I'm out of uh, papers. So, all right. Uh, let's go with... Uh, Exodus 25, verse number 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring me an offering. Of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, ye shall take my offering. Notice the willingly with his heart. Um, you'll, you'll get this a lot on the, uh, oh, an influx of people. And I am not prepared. I have chocolates for those of you who do have the, the kids are here, so sorry, guys. <laughs> the memory verse, he already did that, right? Uh, we're in Exodus 25. The, uh, the willing heart there, uh, a lot of people say, uh, all you want to do is you want to get our money. Um, you're only there for the money. And God is not interested in your money. If you know, he owns uh, the cattle on a thousand hills. He has everything. He spoke the world into existence. He certainly doesn't need your five dollars, uh, but he will use whatever you willingly give. So this is a willing offering from a willing heart, not one that was wrenched out of you or coerced out of you or anything like that. Uh, anybody who does that is just in it for them, their own gain, not for uh, the blessing of God. But God will bless a willing heart who gives even if it's given to a person who's not going to use it appropriately, but because God looks at the heart of the person, not the, uh, the, per the, yeah. the heart of the person is the matter. So a willing heart, he's taking this offering. So God asks to bring an offering, and this is the offering which ye shall take of them, gold and silver and brass and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hairs, goat's hair, and ram's skin dyed red, and badger's skin, and shittim wood, oil for the light, spices for anointing oil, and for sweet incense, onyx stones, and stones to be set in the ephod, and in the breastplate, 
and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Lord, thank you for the scriptures. As we do take a brief look at this tabernacle that you set up and we compare that with how Christ is that uh, for us in this day and age and how he has taken care of those things, Lord, uh, we ask that you just uh, allow us to understand these things. Uh, use the, the lesson today to encourage and strengthen uh, your people. In Jesus' name. Amen. So the purpose of this offering is to make a, tank, a sanctuary, a place for God to dwell among the people. Um, God dwelt in the tabernacle here. In the past, this is obviously in the past, uh, we are in the present, but in the past, uh, Exodus chapter number 29 just gives that uh, brief uh, statement and in verse 43, and there I will meet with the children of Israel and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory and I will sanctify the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar. I will sanctify also both Aaron and his sons to minister to me in the priest's office, and I will dwell among the children of Israel and will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God that brought them forth out of the land of Egypt, that I may dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. So God uh, shows us that this tabernacle that we're going to look at is the place that he's going to dwell in with the children of Israel. Uh, we also know that he was uh, there with them as they were coming out of the, uh, of, of the land of Egypt. He was a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. He was dwelling among them and was their guide. But if we look at uh, today, God has a different tabernacle. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. First Corinthians chapter number 3, very familiar verse. And we find in verse number 16. 1 Corinthians 3.16 Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Present day, when uh, you get saved, when you receive Christ as your Savior, you accept that free gift of salvation on the cross, Christ comes and dwells in you, and you are the tabernacle. And uh, <clears throat> that's where he's chosen to be at this time. Uh, John 14, 23 says, Jesus answered and said unto them, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and will come unto him and make our abode with him. So this body that you see before you and your body that you have uh, is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Oftentimes we live our life not realizing or not really putting enough weight on that fact that Christ is with us always. In everything that we say, do, every place that we go, everything that we see, God is there. He is with us. Um, Ephesians chapter number 2, verse 18 to 22 says, For through Him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto the holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. And then we know that prophecy in Revelation chapter 21 gives us that future dwelling. And I heard a great voice out of heaven, verse number three, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. So he is coming to rule and reign and uh, live on this earth one day when he fixes it. So the dwelling places of God and this is uh, the purpose of the tabernacle. He wanted the tabernacle built so that he could dwell among the people. And so it was an important thing. Uh, <clears throat> spoke about the pillar of fire. Uh, and uh, another reason that we have this tabernacle is uh, the very first one, which we'll talk about briefly. Uh, if you want to look at, at it in Leviticus 
chapter 17, there was a a need for atonement. Uh, Christ had not come and made the ultimate sacrifice. The ultimate paid that atonement for us yet. But there had to be uh, an atonement made for sin. And that we find in Leviticus 17, verse number uh, 5, bringing the sacrifices to the door to the tabernacle, uh, to the end, oh, well, and bring, bring it not unto the, uh, so picks it up, go back to, well, let's just pick it up from verse 1, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and to his sons and to all the children of Israel, and say unto them, This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded, saying, What man soever there be of the house of Israel that killeth an ox or lamb or goat in the camp, or that killeth it out of the camp, and bringeth it not to the door, unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation to offer an offering unto the Lord before the tabernacle of the Lord, blood shall be imputed unto that man, he that shed blood, and, he, and that man shall be cut off from among his people to the end that the children of Israel may bring their sacrifices which they offer in an open field, even that they may bring them unto the Lord unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, unto the priests, and offer them for a peace offering unto the Lord. So he didn't want people just going off and doing their own thing and saying, oh, yeah, that's a sacrifice. He wanted one place where they could come and they could have the atonement made for a purpose to God, where God was. So he's given this tabernacle as a way for them to come to see him, to deal with him. High priests were given very specific rules going in and out. That's why I say uh, this particular lesson is uh, fairly complex and we'll never get through the whole of it in one shot. But uh, the tabernacle itself is a, an interesting, um, interesting thing. And then, of course, we're going to be comparing that, hopefully, by the end of the lesson, to the fact that Christ... This was an example of what Christ was going to do for us. And we'll look at those seven ways, hopefully, at the end. Now, we're going to go to uh, verse number nine, and we're going to start looking at the tabernacle. You have a picture there, and uh, the picture is not to scale by any means. It's just something I grabbed real quick uh, to give you an idea of the items that are there and the, the basic layout of it. Uh, If you didn't know, this is east, this is west, north, south, and that's how it was always set up. So you entered in from the east. You walked towards God from the east, and then you walked away towards the west, uh, sorry, towards the west to God, and then east away from God. Um, That is just the way that it was always set up, and I had another photos. I don't think we'll have time to get into it. Um, There was a specific way that they were supposed to set the tabernacle up and a specific place for each of the tribes to camp uh, around the tabernacle. Again, interesting stuff for some of us. Um, Verse number nine. Now this next, uh, how do I do this? This next uh, passage of scripture, we're going to be basically cruising through from Chapter 25 all the way through um, chapter 27, most of 27, and even some of 30, if we're going to look at the specifics of the tabernacle. Let's read briefly here, and we'll see how we go. Uh, Verse number 9, According to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. So God is telling Moses, I'm going to tell you specifically how to do it. And they, they shall make an ark of shittim wood, Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the length, the height thereof. So we've talked about this before. What's a cubit? Does anyone else? Well, yeah. No, I, I understand because I'm American, so I know what inches are. I was just wondering if anyone else knew what inches were. Yes, it's tip of the finger to the elbow, and it was dependent on the person. So you had some of the giants who had a cubit that were like, eh, too big, and then you had Caleb. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, scratch that. You had smaller ones. <laughs> so a cubit, we would say anywhere from 400 to 600 mil, depending on your size, we, in the past, have averaged it to 500 just so it's easy. 
So we'll say 500 mil, half a, half a meter. Is that all right? Yeah. 18 to 24 inches is what I was, what, if you're going to go with the inches one. Uh, so this altar is two cubits and a half long. So 1,200 wide, about that wide. Yeah. And uh, cubit and a half the breadth and a cubit and a half the height. So about 750. Roughly. Um, this is uh, the Ark of the Covenant. That's all the way back, back in the Holy of Holies. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold within and without shalt thou overlay it and shalt make upon it a crown of gold round about and thou shalt cast four rings of gold for it and put them in the four corners thereof and two rings shall be on the one side and two rings in the other side of it and thou shalt make staves of shittim wood and sh overlay them with gold and thou shalt put the staves into the rings by the side of the ark and the ark may be born with them and the staves shall be in the rings of the ark, and they shall not be taken from it. And thou shalt put it into, uh, put into the ark the testimony which I shall give thee. Um, who remembers what the testimony was given? Who can tell me what the testimonies were given that were in the ark? Anyone? One of them. What's that? The Ten Commandments, the tables of stone? Yep. The second lot of tables of stone, because remember what happened to the first one. What else was in there? Should be some manna, yes. What else? One rod in particular, Aaron's rod, yes, Aaron's rod. And then there's one more thing. I don't even have the verse for this. I know it's, I'm pretty sure it's in Deuteronomy. Uh, what's that? He, he dwelt in the mercy seat, which is above the ark, the law. Moses says when he finished the law, he said, put the, put the book of this law in there for a testimony. And I don't have the verse for it. I did find it while I was studying, but I didn't write it down, so I apologize. I think it's in Deuteronomy somewhere. Um, all right, so we have the uh, testimony this is given. And then we have the mercy seat, and thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof in a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and shall make uh, two cherubims of gold of beaten work, shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat, and make one cherub on the one end, and the other cherub on the other end, even of the mercy seat shall ye make it, and the cherubims of the two ends thereof. And the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one to another toward the mercy seat, shall the faces of the cherubims be. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above the uh, above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things which I give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. So that's why I say he, God dwells above the ark in between the, the cherubs on the mercy seat. Then we get to the table. The table is... Um, in the uh, holy place, so you get the, the diagram there. The ark is in the holy of holies, the holy place, table of showbread. Thou shalt make also a table of shittim wood, two cubits shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof, and thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, and make there to a crown of gold round about, and thou shalt make unto it a border of an hand breadth round about, and thou shalt make a golden crown to the border thereof round about. And thou shalt make for it four rings of gold, and put the four put in the ring put the rings in the four corners that are on the four feet thereof, over against the border shall the rings be for places of the staves to bear the table. And thou shalt make the staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold, that the table may be borne with them, and thou shalt make the dishes thereof, the spoons thereof, and cover them uh, and covers thereof and the bowls thereof to cover with all of pure gold shalt thou make them. Uh, and thou shalt set upon the table showbread before me always. So there's a table of showbread in the holy place. And um, 
that was meant to be there as representation for what? The bread of God. I mean, firstly, there was what was on the, yeah, what was on the, uh, what was on the table of showbread. There was always supposed to be twelve loaves of bread on the. Why do you think that is? Twelve tribes of Israel. Twelve tribes of Israel providing that uh, that um, bread of life to the children of Israel. So we have the table of showbread there, and then we have the candlestick right across from it on your your um, diagram. It'll say menorah. Uh, on the uh, south side. So. And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold, of beaten work shall the candlestick be made. His shaft and his branches, his bowls, his knops, and his flowers shall be of the same. And six branches shall come out of the sides of it, three branches of the candlestick out of one side, and three branches of the candlestick out of the other side, three bowls made like unto almonds with a knop and a flower in one branch, and three bowls made like almonds in the other branch with a knop, and a flower. So in the six branches that come out of the candlestick, and in the candlestick shall be uh, flower bowls made like unto almonds with their knops and their flowers, and there shall be a knop under two branches of the same, and a knop under two branches of the same, and a knop under two branches of the same, according to the six branches that proceed out of the candlestick. And their knops and their branches shall be of the same, all of it shall be one beaten work of pure gold, and thou shalt make the seven lamps thereof. And they shall, shall light the, the lamps thereof, that they may give light over against it. And the tongs thereof, and the snuff dishes thereof, shall be of pure gold. Of a talent of pure gold shall he make it with all, his ve all these vessels. And look, thou, uh, look that thou make them after their pattern, which was showed thee in the mount. So Moses is given very specific directions and patterns to follow. And so he is supposed to pass that along to the artificers who are going to make this stuff. And they're going to make all this stuff out of the offering that was given willingly. And that offering, where did they get that offering from? <laughs> they took it off the Egyptians. <laughs> they borrowed. I believe the Bible says they borrowed from the Egyptians as much as they could and then took off. And then since the Egyptians died, I guess they said, that's ours. We'll keep that. All right. So then we have the curtains. And these are made out of the goat's hairs and the, uh, some more boards and some, um, some of the fabrics. And they, he talks about the bars and the veil. Uh, the veil in, in Exodus 26, verse 31. Uh, that's the veil that separates the, it's on your diagram there separates the holy of holies from the holy place and the veil and thou shalt make the veil of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen of cunning work with cherubims shall it be made and thou shalt hang it upon four pillars of shittim wood overlaid with gold their hooks shall be of gold upon the four sockets exodus 26 verse 33 and thou shalt hang up the veil under the tatches that thou mayest bring it Thither within the veil, the ark of the testimony, and the veil shall divide unto you between the holy place and the most holy. And thou shalt put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the most holy place, and thou shalt set the table over uh, table without the veil, and the candlestick over against the table on the side of the tabernacle toward the south. And thou shalt put the table on the north side, and thou shalt make it hanging for the door of the tent of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen, wrought with needlework, and thou shalt make uh, for the hanging five pillars of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold, and their hooks shall be gold of gold, and thou shalt cast five sockets of brass for them. So we've got this veil, and then we have the uh, entrance all being uh, dealt with here of uh, fine twined linen, of scarlet and fine, and fine linen and purple and blue. Uh, apparently one of those things that was very royal at the time and quite expensive. So uh, when we talk about Christ making the ultimate sacrifice for us and that veil being torn, it was something that was supernatural and could not just be done by anyone. Nobody was uh, big enough to do that. I was going to look at the size of that. 
and I didn't have that one written down. Ah, there we go, the covering the boards. 10 cubits shall be the length of the board, and the cubit and the half shall be the breadth of it, which makes up the boards that surround the uh, holy place. So it's 10 cubits tall. And then I believe... Huh, I didn't write it down. I think it's on my other diagram. All right, so we have the uh, veil and doors being made. And then we also have now the uh, altar in, verse, in chapter 27, uh, verse number 1, Exodus 27, 1. And thou shalt make an altar of shittim wood five cubits long and five cubits broad. And the altar shall be four square, and the height thereof shall be three cubits. So it's quite tall. It's probably up in this area as far as height, and it's five cubits wide, which is bigger than I can go. Um, yeah, bigger than my span, bigger than me. So it's a big altar. And thou shalt make the horns of it upon the four corners thereof. His horns shall be of the same. Thou shalt overlay it with brass. And thou shalt make his pans to receive his ashes and his shovels and his basins and his flesh hooks and his fire pans. All the vessels thereof shall be made of shalt make of brass and thou shalt make for it a grate of network of brass and upon the net shalt thou make four brazen rings in the four corners thereof and thou shalt put it under the com compass of the altar beneath uh, that the net may be even to the midst of the altar and thou shalt make staves for the altar staves of shittim wood and overlay them with brass and the staves shall be put into the rings and the staves shall be upon the two sides of the altar to bear it Hollow with boards shalt thou make it, as it was showed thee in the mount, so shall they make it. So we have the altar, which is there in the courtyard, uh, described for us being quite large, uh, possibly over two meters wide, and uh, same depth, and then uh, a meter and a half or so tall. So it's a big altar, and this is where most of the sacrifices were brought. Can we have the picture up? So the dimensions, the court, we start to describe this. Thou shalt make the court of the tabernacle for the south side. Southward shall be hangings for the court, fine twine linen of an hundred cubits long for one side. So oh, do you have the other one, the, the one that was hard for you? Yeah, that one. Okay, so this one's a bit more to scale, so you can see an idea of what space there was. Because there's a lot of space in the tabernacle. They did a lot of work. You came in from over here, um, and this length here, from here to there, is 100 cubits. So a, long, a pretty, pretty long way. If we did a half, a cub half a meter as a cubit, that would be 50 meters long. Now, this building here, for reference, uh, from front to back, is only about 20 meters. Okay, so two and a half times this room here is the tabernacle. Now, um, verse number 10, And twenty pillars thereof and twenty sockets shall be of brass, and the hooks of their pillars and their fillets shall be overlaid of, shall be of silver. And likewise, for the north side, length shall be hangings of an hundred cubits long, and his 20 pillars and their 20 sockets of brass and their hooks and their pillars and their fillets uh, of silver. So they got on, on, your, on yours, you see the little individual spots. Those are the boards. And then there's curtains hanging in between each one of those for the whole length of both. And for the breadth of the court on the west side over here shall be 50 cubits. So that's 25 meters across. So 50 cubits, and uh, the west shall have hanging of 50 cubits, their pillars 10, and their sockets 10, and the breadth of the court on the east word shall be 50 cubits. And the hanging on the one side of the gate shall be 15 cubits, and their pillars 3, and their sockets 3. So the gate, I don't know why that says 20. Didn't we just read that as 15? 
obviously inaccurate drawings. The hanging of one side of the gate shall be 15 cubits, their pillars three and their sockets three. And on the other side shall be hanging 15 cubits, their pillars three and their sockets three. And for the gates of the court shall be in hanging of 20 cubits. Ah, there we go. The gate of the court is 20 cubits. Um, and they're of purple and scarlet and fine twine linen wrought with needlework, and their pillars shall be four and their sockets four, and the pillars round about the court shall be filleted with silver, and their hooks shall be of silver, and their sockets of brass. Uh, so the length of the court shall be in 100 cubits, and the breadth 50 everywhere, and the height 5 cubits of fine twine linen, and their sockets of brass. So 5 cubits tall, and all, which is the outside perimeter, 5 cubits tall, and 50 by 100 cubits long. Now, um, it goes into... The oil, he goes into Aaron's garments um, and how he was supposed to be dressed. Very specific. Uh, you didn't go mess with, you don't, you don't mess with God anytime, let's put it that way. But this was very specific. And if you did not follow it to the letter, God said he would take care of it. You know how that happens. The two boys who decided to, uh, we'll make our own incense. Fire came out and dealt with the problem, and they were no longer a problem. So you didn't want to mess around with this stuff. God was very specific. He gave Moses very specific dimensions, very specific rules, regulations, and how to do it. And then he starts into the um, garments and then the, the, some of the uh, offerings that were supposed to be made. But head on over to chapter number uh, 30. Uh, Yes, chapter number 30. We're going to look at two more things. <coughs> We've looked. He took it away. Where is it? We've looked at the, all, the Ark of the Covenant. We've looked at the table of showbread. We've looked at the golden candlesticks. And we've looked at the uh, brazen altar. And we've looked at the tabernacle as a whole. Uh, we have not looked at this or this. So, now he lost all hundreds again. We're never going to get that one back. Uh, so, go to uh, Exodus chapter 30, and we're going to read in verse number 1. And uh, the, thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon of shit and wood shall thou make it. A cubit shall be the length thereof, a cubit the breadth thereof. Four square shall it be, and two cubits shall be the height thereof. So, this is significantly smaller than the altar outside in the court. This one is the altar of incense in the holy place. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, verse 3, the top thereof and the sides thereof round about and the horns thereof, and thou shalt make it unto it a crown of gold round about, and the two golden rings shalt thou make to it under the crown of it uh, by the two corners thereof upon the two sides of it shalt thou make it, and they shall be for places for the staves to bear it withal. And thou shalt make the staves of shittim wood and overlay them with gold, and thou shalt put it before the veil, that is, by the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat, that is, over the testimony where I will meet with thee. And Aaron shall burn thereon sweet incense every morning. When he dresseth the lamps, he shall burn incense upon it. And when Aaron lighteth the lamps at even, he shall burn incense upon it, a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall offer no strange incense thereon, nor burnt sacrifices, nor meat offerings, neither shall ye pour drink offering thereon. So this is a very specific uh, incense altar that is always supposed to be burning, always supposed to be there. And we'll look at that as a picture of the spirit of uh, the way that God deals with us in spirit. Go down to verse number 17, and we're going to look at this brass, this laver. Um, very little given about this one. Verse number 17 of Exodus chapter 30, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Thou shalt make, also make a laver of brass, and his foot also of brass, to wash withal. And thou shalt put it between the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, and thou shalt wash, shall put water therein, for Aaron and his son shall wash their hands and their feet thereat. When they go into the tabernacle of the congregation, they shall wash with water, that they die not. Or when they come near to the altar to minister to burn offering made by fire unto the Lord, so they shall wash their hands 
and their feet, that they die not, and it shall be a statue forever to them, even to him and to his seed throughout their generations. So this, that's what we're given as far as the brazen, uh, the laver. It was meant to go between the altar, the altar of burnt offerings and the holy place. And the priests were supposed to wash regularly because they were supposed to come before the Lord clean. And those are the seven items of the tabernacle that I wanted to point out. And now we're going to parallel that with Christ. So now we're going to do a quick Bible study, uh, picking up some verses in the New Testament. So we have Exodus chapter 27, uh, verse 16, talks about the door of the court. And we saw that on the east side. So firstly, if you'll go with me to John chapter number 10. John chapter number 10. Try to wrap this all up in just the allotted time given. I know I'm speaking fast and there is a lot to get out of the study of the tabernacle. People have written entire books on it. There's even life-size replicas built in some place in the world. I don't know where it is, but you can go have a look at it if you wanted to. Uh, John chapter number 10 and verse number 9 says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. So we see that Christ is the door. Uh, he is the door that allows us the free gift of eternal life. John 14, 6 says, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto me, unto the Father, but by me. So people want to say, I, I'm good enough. I can get to heaven. I can do whatever I want to do, but I will attain it. And God says, no, there is no way to get to the Father but through Christ. And uh, it's very clear and plain. John 3.16, we know, says, Whosoever will may come. Whosoever will may come. Um, so we looked at the, uh, the door. <clears throat> now we have the altar. What was the altar for? Sacrifice of atonement. Uh, problem was that every time you came and made a sacrifice for sin, you followed the rules, you walked away, what happened? <clears throat> well, you, you had sin in your life again. It didn't take it away. You had to go back and sacrifice again. No matter how many times they sacrificed, whether 500 or 1,000 or whatever, they always had to come back and sacrifice again. Go with me to uh, Hebrews chapter number 9. Hebrews chapter number 9. I'm going to look at a couple of verses here. Firstly, we'll pick up verse number 22. For Hebrews 9, 22 says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, which is why they had to sacrifice. Blood was the sacrifice that they needed. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Go back to verse number 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. He had retained eternal redemption for us. Christ went in once with the blood that could take care of the problem. And so we are saved from sin because of his blood. Verse number 26 of the same chapter, For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He did, he did it once, and it was done. Go over to chapter number 10 and pick it up in verse number 8. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 8. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offerings for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law, then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish a second. So they get given the law to offer sacrifices for sin. 
Then Christ came and he's like, right, that was then. Now I'm going to establish this by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. So we have that salvation and that sacrifice is ours and done permanently. And we no longer have to sacrifice every day. So then we have the, the, the brazen laver, which is the next one in. And that is, uh, so remember, Peter was uh, there and Jesus came up and he wanted to wash his feet. And he said, no, no, you can't, you can't do that. And he's like, well, if, if I don't wash you, you're none of me. And he's like, oh, well, then everything. And God said, no, no, you're mine. All you just, I just need, to, just need to clean the feet. So we as Christians are saved. You're saved. Done. Sin's covered. <clears throat> Doesn't mean we don't still sin. We don't still need to go back to God and say, hey, I messed up again. Can I please be forgiven of this sin? It's not that we're getting saved again. Salvation is once done. But we do have to deal with staying clean, right? You walk through the world, you're going to get dirty. You walk in, you're working in the garden, you go inside, you're going to wash your hands because they're dirty, you want to eat. And just like the priest had to stay clean before God, we have to stay clean before God. And we need to make sure that we're constantly on top of those things in our life. Not that we're re-saved. No, salvation was once and done. You're saved, you're secure, it's done. God said, you're, you're in my Father's hand, you cannot be taken out. But we do have to deal with the dirt that comes up in our lives. And it's always there. For every one of us, it might be different things. So we have the labor that we uh, need to make sure that we stay, uh, have a clean life. Um, 1 John 1, 9, if he's, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins if we would ask forgiveness. Um, uh, he, Ephesians 5, 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. By, by following what God says, by doing what God wants us to do, by obeying His commandments and, and following those things, we can keep our life clean. People think, I can do it my own way. Well, <laughs> God gave very specific instructions on how to do it, so why don't you just stick with the specific instructions. And then we have the uh, table of showbread in there. We talked about that being the bread of life for uh, the children of Israel, the, the 12 tribes being represented. Go to John chapter number 6 real quick. We might make it. John chapter 6. Christ tells us here in uh, Verse 32, Jesus, then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven, speaking of Jesus Christ, and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. And he that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. So Christ is that table of showbread for us. He is that life that we look for and the life that we need. And then we have a cross from it, the, the candlestick. Uh, go over to chapter number 8. Go over to John chapter number 8. Verse number 12, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. That, life. that light was meant to be trimmed morning and night and stay on permanently. And Christ came and he says, I am the light of the world. I will give you that direction, that understanding. We have uh, many verses that we could look at there. We'll move on to the altar of incense. Speaking about the... Uh, Worshiping God, go over to John chapter number 4. 
the altar of incense was supposed to be burning continually. It's supposed to be an example of uh, worshiping God. John 4, verse 24 says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. People say, uh, I'll worship God in my own way, in my own place, at my own time. And God said, no, you'll do it this way. And you'll do it according to my direction and my purpose because God is a spirit and we must worship him in spirit and in truth. Hebrews 13, 15 says, By him therefore let us offer the sacrifices of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. When we uh, honor God and we put God first, we are worshiping him. By, by being in church on a Sunday, you have set aside some other things and put God first. And you have come to a place where you can worship God and, and give that sweet incense to him. And then we have the, <clears throat> the mercy seat. Uh, the mercy seat represents the propitiation for sin that we get through Christ. First John two, first John chapter two, verse number two. The propitiation for sin. We no longer have to go through the high priest. We can come to Christ on our own. God gave us the opportunity to become a child of God. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, <clears throat> I wanted to continue on with that, so I might go there real quick. You just stay there. Um, Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. First uh, John 2, 2 says, And He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Uh, God is... Jesus Christ is that access to God that the holy, the priest got once a year at the Holy of Holies. Once a year, God said, you can come in. Once a year, with the right sacrifices in place, you can come in. If you did it any other way, the priest died. And then there was a new high priest. Today, we have access to God directly through Jesus Christ. When we accept Him as our Savior, we have direct access to God. That's powerful. So we have the tabernacle here, and I know that was a very brief and quick overview, but we have the different aspects of the tabernacle, seven different aspects, and we compared those as Jesus Christ uh, is our, um, our Savior. Go to John chapter number 1. And we'll finish with this verse, which will be the memory verse. John chapter number 1, verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory, uh, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus Christ is all the tabernacle was to the children of Israel, to us. So let's take that as a memory verse. John 1, 14, and we'll close in prayer. Lord, thank you for the pictures that we have and how you have orchestrated all of this, giving Moses the specific directions and how to build and what to build, and then fulfilling all of that through Christ, the sacrifice for the world, and giving us that propitiation for our sins. We thank you. We ask that you would help us to be mindful of just who we are when we have the temple, that we are the, the temple of the Holy Ghost. Guide and direct as we go forward. Bless the morning service. Give us what we need as we listen to that. In Jesus' name, amen.